Pretty, isn't it? Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from the Y, and today we're gonna be taking a look at Infinity War. In all honesty, the Marvel Cinematic Universe might have peaked with this very film. It was the culmination of years and years of plot development surrounding Thanos, the Infinity Stones, and the Avengers as we knew them. And yes, this is a story about Thanos and he definitely won. I remember seeing it in theaters and being astounded they ended things that way. But at least we only had to wait a year to see things being corrected. On that note, let's get right into the video. Here are 50 facts you didn't know about Infinity War. Infinity War opens with a distress call from the Asgardian refugee vessel Statesman. The voice you're hearing belongs to none other than the director of the original Thor movie, Kenneth Branagh. As Thor Ragnarok takes place right before the events of Infinity War, in the wreckage of the Asgardian spaceship, you can see the remains of the stolen Commodore that Thor used to escape Sakaar. When deciding how to start the movie, the Russo brothers came up with two options. Option A, begin with the flashback of Thanos and Gamora when she was a little girl. And option B is of course what we ended up with. The brothers explained their main reason in going this route was to establish the tone of the movie very early on. And the best way to do that was to kill off a main character in a universe where everyone's been safe for an entire decade. No resurrections this time. We have a Hulk. This line is a callback to the original Avengers movie. I have an army. We have a Hulk. A question I've asked myself many times is just how powerful is Thanos without the Infinity Stones? It's obviously highly subjective, but the opening sequence told us a great deal when he considers a fight with the Hulk as just having a bit of fun, even without the use of the Power Stone. Let him have his fun. Another piece of information you might find interesting is that the writers said that had the hero succeeded in taking the gauntlet off him, there's a good chance they still lose that fight. All that for a drop of blood. <laughs> if Loki the trickster didn't try and pull a fast one on Thanos, I think we'd all have been a little disappointed. And during the lead up to the attempt, you can see that Loki was holding the knife in his hand the entire time. Due to the sheer number of characters present in the film, there wasn't enough screen time for everyone to get their due, and the members of the Black Order may have been the hardest hit by this limitation. Early iterations actually saw them with full-length origin stories, yet they were ultimately deemed unnecessary. A byproduct of this is that we don't know even the most basic things about them, like that Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive were married. The filmmakers also viewed their comic book counterparts as much too powerful, so they handicapped them and also changed some of their powers to better fit who they'd be fighting. For example, Ebony Maw wields the power of manipulation and mind control in the comics, yet only telekinesis in the film. Black Dwarf was renamed to Cole Obsidian, and with that lost all his intelligence. Also, in the graphic novels, he's by far the strongest of the Order, and Corvus Glaive's Glaive stops Vision from phasing in the film, while in the comics, the weapon grants him immortality. One of the most significant changes made to the final version was the attack on Xandar, or lack thereof, as is only briefly mentioned. Thanos already has the Power Stone because he stole it last week when he decimated Xandar. Earlier cuts showed a whole lot more in the form of an entire attack on the Nova Corps that was set to last up to 45 minutes long. In the end, the Russo brothers deemed it unneeded and redundant and thus didn't include it. Going off that, had the Xandar sequence made the final cut, a character named Nova was set to survive and warn Earth about Thanos, in place of the Hulk. And while we're on the topic of characters who didn't make it to the movie, two were left out because of a lack of film rights. Silver Surfer, who originally warned Doctor Strange in the comics, and Mephisto, the inspiration for Ebony Maw. With the film as expansive as Infinity War, almost all the lines in the first draft didn't make it to the final version. However, in saying that, there was one massively crucial piece of dialogue that survived every single rewrite and edit. And here it is. I wouldn't say no to a tuna melt. 
prior to directing Infinity War, the Russo brothers were behind the helm for Captain America Civil War. If you'll recall, it was the last time many of the Avengers were on screen together, and they didn't leave on the best of terms. According to the brothers, this was all totally intentional and a major reason why they were drawn to Civil War in the first place, as by telling the story of the Avengers at their lowest, they were then able to bring them all back together to face the greatest threat the world's ever seen. One of the many deleted scenes included a part where Stark and Potts actually set a wedding date. We don't even have a wedding date yet. You set August 27th. That's the date. decoy date. The date itself is a bit of an easter egg as it's the same day that Robert Downey Jr. got married in real life. It doesn't take a genius to see that Infinity War contains a metric ton of visual effects, yet I don't think anyone could have guessed it had this much. Out of 3,000 total shots, 2,900 had some form of VFX, equating to over 96% of the film. Out of the 100 shots that weren't CGI, the most surprising one of the bunch is a scene in which Parker's spidey senses go off. Anthony Russo explained that all they did to achieve this effect was to have someone blow on Tom Holland's ear. As you can see from the school bus scene, many of the kids from Homecoming make a return appearance. During the part where Stark introduces his new nanotech suit, if you look closely, his glasses disappear shortly after he takes them off. So yeah, that whole action was 100% unnecessary, and he totally did it for dramatic effect and to look cool. You're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. And looking at Bruce Banner's reaction, it's absolutely working. When Tony Stark talks to Pepper while he's on the ship. Tell me you're not on that ship. Yeah. God, no, please tell me you're not Honey, on the ship. Honey, I'm sorry. They use the same score for when Steve Rogers talks to Peggy. I'll get Howard on the line, he'll know what to do. There's not enough time. This thing's moving too fast and it's heading for New York. This is now the third time in counting that Thor's been hit by a vehicle. Ah! Wipers! Wipers! Get it off! Exactly. What? In a movie that exceeded all expectations, the one disappointment was Vision. It honestly felt like a cop-out to just have him immediately get stabbed by the glaive, essentially handicapping him till his eventual death. And originally, this scene was never meant to take place, as the initial plan was to have Outriders attacking Vision and Wanda in Paris, instead of two members of the Black Order in Scotland. To make sure the audience understood what each Infinity Stone did, whenever Thanos acquired a new stone, they had him immediately use it. A big point of contention during development was when to have Steve Rogers show up, and when, if at all, to have him and Stark meet again after their last not-so-friendly encounter. In early drafts, they didn't have Rogers showing up till the two-hour mark, when he would suddenly appear to save Vision at the last second. I think they all realized that this was much too late and scratched that plan. In terms of Stark and Rogers meeting again, there were talks of having them come face to face at Avengers HQ, yet ultimately because it complicated things too much, Captain, I fell out hard. they put it off till Endgame. During the Guardian's visit to the Collector, there is a reference to Tobias Funk's Blue Man from Arrested Development. Oh no no, I'm not in the group yet, oh, I'm afraid I just blew myself. <laughs> So, Mantis doesn't get much screen time, but I'd argue she's by far the best background character, seen by her taking things literally. Alright Guardians, don't forget this might be dangerous, so let's put on our mean faces. And setting her arms like her namesake of Mantis. I wouldn't exactly call Infinity War a faithful adaptation of the comics, however this scene was a direct callback to the graphic novel. All the phone numbers present in the film can't actually exist, as the prefix, which is what you call the three numbers after the area code, cannot start with the 0 or 1. While talking to Thanos, Gamora comments on his chair. I always hated that chair. So I've been told. Proving that she's his favorite daughter, Thanos takes his seat on the steps. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Quill says the following. You attack me the moment I let you go. No, I won't. 
You know, you'd think an evil supervillain would learn how to properly lie. Then, in Infinity War, Thanos explains why that's the case. But I never taught you to lie. That's why you're so bad at it. Infinity War featured two callbacks to Raiders of the Lost Ark, and they both involved Ebony Ma. First up, you got him burning his hand on the Eye of Agamotto, which was a nod to this famous sequence. The second was more of an inspiration, if anything. But when Indiana Jones brings a pistol to a sword fight, they were like, okay, we don't need another five minute action sequence. If Indy can pull off a cheap shot like that, so can Iron Man. Your powers are inconsequential compared to mine. Yeah, but the kid's seen more movies. Out of the 14 million possibilities Doctor Strange perceived, I wonder if he saw the one in which he wore Iron Man's suit, nicknamed Iron Strange. The deleted sequence was set to take place on board the Q-ship, and involves Stark transferring his armor to Doctor Strange in an effort to protect him from Ebony Maw's needles. And although we were never blessed enough to see Iron Strange in action, in the years since, concept artists have designed what could have been. If aliens wind up implanting eggs in my chest or something and I eat one of you, I'm sorry. I do not want another single pop culture reference out of you. A minute later, this image looks very reminiscent of a certain scene in the original Alien. Do it, Quill. I can take it. No, he can't take it. She's right, you can't. Even though Infinity War was the darkest film in MCU history, there was still an ample amount of humor. Where is Gamora? Yeah, I'll do you one better. Who's Gamora? I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? Supposedly, besides being one of the funniest lines of the movie, it was also totally improvised. I definitely never caught this on any of my watchthroughs, but even Parker disagrees with Quill on this one. You know Thor? Yeah. Tall guy, not that good looking. Much like Holland in real life, I might add. I don't know, Mary Kill. I don't like this game because it has the F word. This is a Disney movie. Mary Kill. The endless sand dunes of Vormir were shot in the Brazilian national park Alençoas Maranhenses. Also, not quite sure if this was intentional or not, but if you've ever seen the anime Berserk, everything about this shot looks like the eclipse. Not to mention the fact that both concepts revolve around sacrificing what you love most for godlike power. As Red Skull was chronologically the first character in the MCU to be obsessed with the Infinity Stones, writers McFeely and Marcus posited it was only fitting that he appear in Infinity War. Hugo Weaving said he was looking forward to reprising his role, yet after finding negotiations with Marvel to be impossible, he had to back out. If you ever wondered what they're chanting, it's Kosa for Hold Strong or Hold Fast. Here's a great example of Thanos using the stones to their max potential. When Doctor Strange creates doubles of himself and holds Thanos down, he uses the Power Stone to escape and the Soul Stone to find the real Strange, with it effectively knocking his soul out of his body for a brief second. Among the Infinity Stones, the Time Stone has to be one of the strongest. It gives complete dominion over the past, present, and future, and is even shown healing the wound inflicted by Stormbreaker at the end of the movie. You should have gone for the head. The Russo brothers had different nicknames for many of the characters. They referred to Bruce Banner as the Herald from Space, as he warns everyone of the oncoming attack. Peter Quill as Peter Pan as his mother dies of cancer, gets kidnapped at a young age, and is raised by pirates, and Doctor Strange as the adult in the room. I'm sorry, I, I'm confused as to the relationship here. I mean, what, what, what is he, your ward? No. To avoid any potential leaks, the cast all received fake copies of the script that had key moments that were altered. These scripts were nicknamed Code Blue, and only one actor, Robert Downey Jr., received the full script nicknamed Code Red. By now, I think we've all seen how Tom Holland can't keep a secret to save his life. So when Infinity War came around and they were taking all kinds of measures to keep things on lockdown, they had to make sure Holland didn't know a thing. As Joe Russo made very clear, Tom Holland gets his lines and that's it. He doesn't even know who he's acting opposite of. We use like very vague terms to describe to him what is happening in the scene. Insect. I don't know about you, but there would have been no complaints from me had they left in all these deleted scenes. First up, there is a flashback during the talk between Thanos and Gamora when she was still loyal and his best soldier. 
The next deleted sequence involved Quill and Drax arguing over music. Turn it back on. Can't keep listening to the same song again and again and again. Causing them to miss a message from Nebula, alerting the crew to Gamora's whereabouts. You didn't see the blinking yellow light? I did, but you said if it was yellow, let it mellow. Brown flush it down, those were your orders. We additionally missed out on a very intriguing development between Thanos and Doctor Strange, where the former sends the Mad Titan to a certain mindscape to face the Living Tribunal, who judges him guilty of his crimes. And finally, there was a point at which Thanos separated multiple souls from their bodies. And this would have been cool for two reasons. One, we don't really get to see too much of the Soul Stone in combat. And two, the predicament called upon Mantis to solve the problem, and we barely get to see her as well. They're out too long, they will die. I don't know how to fix that. No, I know you don't, but she does. Because every single actor except for RDJ had the script nicknamed Code Blue, none of them knew if their character survived the snap or not till the day of filming. Elizabeth Olsen explained that the Russos took them all into a van, told them who lived and who didn't, and then literally said, go, now we're shooting it. This obviously left much of the cast in a state of shock, yet I kinda like the way they went about it, as I feel like doing it this way may have helped invoke a more authentic reaction. No. No, 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 Groot. An interesting, yet also very sad little detail is that the reason Peter Parker's death seemed way longer than all the others is that his spidey senses detected what was happening and started regenerating, slowing the process down. This additionally resulted in him feeling that something was amiss, bringing us to one of the most heartbreaking sequences of the entire film. I don't want to go. I don't want to go, sir, please. As you'd have it, the whole bit of I don't want to go wasn't scripted at all and came about from a certain acting technique that Holland employs to cry at will. I love you so much, I love you so much. And then it like... It just kind of brings up emotion. So for Infinity War, he simply switched the phrase from I love you so much to I don't want to go, and instead of saying it in his head, spoke it out loud. There's no definitive timeline surrounding the events of the film, but the writers guess that start to finish, it's around two days. I literally didn't even remember this till I read it, but in the original announcement for the movies, they called it Infinity War Part 1 and Infinity War Part 2. Trin Tron, the executive producer for both films, gave some insight in what led to the name change. We wanted to make these two movies distinctive and give each their own story. Infinity War was a story about Thanos, and Endgame was a story about our heroes. As Infinity War centered on Thanos, that makes him the protagonist and the hero of the story. If you think about it, it's his journey that we're following, and his quest for the stones that pushes the plot forward. Along the way, he encounters many challenges, but overcomes every single one, and is forced to sacrifice everything dear to him to achieve his ultimate goal. What did it cost? Everything. And finally, after completing his quest, like all heroes do, Thanos retires in peace knowing he changed the world for the better against all odds. And if you still don't believe he's the hero of this film, Thanos has the most screen time of any character at 29 minutes, a full 10 minutes more than anyone else. After Thanos, Gamora has the second most screen time coming in at 19 and a half minutes. And if you were paying attention, there were two subtle moments where she clearly felt the presence of her adopted stepfather. Joe Russo said, One is over her shoulder when they first arrive at the Ark, knowing there's very few people in the universe who could enact that kind of destruction. And then again here, feeling it as she's landing that they may be too late. Tom Holland said that although he loves Chris Pratt, working with him was actually kinda difficult. And no, it's not cause he's an asshole or lazy or really anything negative for that matter. He was simply too funny, which made it challenging for Holland to keep a straight face during their scenes. You can Footloose the movie? Exactly like Footloose. Is it still the greatest movie in history? It never was. In line with being the hero of the story, Thanos stole the show and even got many people to root for him in his quest to bring balance to the universe. His popularity inevitably spawned many memes, with the large majority of them coming from the subreddit, Thanos did nothing wrong. And much like Thanos, the members of the subreddit had big plans. Sick and tired of producing memes with no end goal in mind, they came up with a crazy idea. They were going to ban half the subreddit. The Reddit admins were contacted to see if such a thing was even possible. 
four days later, the plan was approved. And four days after that, with the video message from Josh Brolin, the banning commenced. Here we go, Reddit users. After the dust settled, over 300,000 members were gone, and Balance was finally brought to the subreddit. This might be my favorite part of the video as we get to go over unused concept art and imagine a timeline where they actually exist. I'm kinda upset they deprived us of this one, as the Hulk tearing out of the Hulkbuster during the fight with Cole Obsidian sounds absolutely legit. The same goes for this image, which shows an alternate way of Thor acquiring Stormbreaker, one in which he travels to Jormungard and battles the Children of the World Serpent along with Rocket and Groot. Here's an unused fight between Drax and Thanos. I'm reminded of how shitty it is that Drax never even got close to getting his revenge. A little side note, Infinity War was actually the first time that Bruce Banner talks to Hulk in the MCU. And they very nearly came face to face. And finally, Nick Fury almost met an early end at the hands of Corvus Glaive. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. Alright, till next time, have a great day everyone!